Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 725. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is March 29th, 2022. All right, thanks for joining us for another show of Anglican Unscripted, where George and I sit down in front of our webcams, open up the internet, and discuss everything we see in front of us. And there's a lot of news out there. Some of it's not really important, some is very important, and some of it's transformational to the church, and that's the kind of the stuff that George and I like to uh, uh, to talk about. Now, I've not really uh, made any show notes this week. I wanted to make it a little bit more unscripted to see how that works. You guys may hate it, you may love it. Let us know in the show notes. But before we get there, George, do you have a mortgage yet? No, no. no. Last Friday, I couldn't film because I had to go to Orlando and sell some little personal treasures. The mortgage company wanted me to raise more cash. Now, before the children were born, when I, Susan and I were married and I had disposable income, I had a hobby of collecting militaria, uh, military items. Mm -hmm. And uh, some my grandfathers brought back from the war, others I had purchased over the years. and. Uh, I had to sell a pistol. I had to sell some medals. Uh, and the darndest thing is, is that uh, if you go to an auction or if you have a, a formal sale, you do pretty well. But when you need the cash now, uh, you don't do that well. <laughs> Bobby Jr.'s Pawn and Dawn, yes. <laughs> Not that bad, but... Uh, um, well, for instance, when the, the pistol uh, that I sold uh, actually had been issued to my grandfather when he was a cadet, when he was a midshipman at the Naval Academy, mm -hmm. and I'm not a pistol person, I'm not a gun person, and uh, taking it down to the gun dealer, uh, he said, "Well, you know, if this was in a hundred percent condition with its providence, it'd be worth about five, six thousand dollars. Sure, absolutely. But because it's only an eighty percent, there's some holster wear and there's some starting of corrosion." Uh, it's maybe worth about 2000 and I'll only pay half because I could sell it tomorrow. I could sell it in 10 years. I just don't uh, know when it'll go. So that's what I offer. And so we wiggled around a bit, but uh, my dreams of getting $6,000 for a gun uh, were not met. But uh, um, I really should have gone down to the corner of our local 7-Eleven and sold it on the street. And I would have gotten more money, I think. But no receipts. Oh, well. you know, no re that's <laughs> the and I asked, the, I asked the gun dealer for a receipt, and he looked at me oddly because he says, you know, most people who are selling guns don't want receipts. They want anonymity. They just want cash. Uh -huh. I said, well, I'm happy to take a check, and I'm happy to take a receipt. So I was sort of... Through Kevin, you advised me. I should have worn my collar when I went down. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is for the orphanage. <laughs> this is for the orphanage. <laughs> but, uh, oh, well, these yeah. are things you have to do. And uh, um, I don't have any sons, so there's no interest in uh, the military on my girl's side. So, yeah. Well, that's why it's so interesting to watch shows like Antique Roadshow. Because I have three kids, and my kids don't want any of our antiques or any of our furniture or any of our junk. Dad, we're going to buy your own. And so, but you're watching, there's this uh, guy who's a Vietnam vet. While he was in Vietnam, he bought a Rolex watch for $318. He took it to Ann Creek's Roadshow in its original box that he kept in a safe deposit box all this time since 1971 and found out the value was five hundred dollars to $700,000. You're good. I'll put a link to that show in the show notes. Oh, boy. All right, we should get on to news. Uh, not much happening here. I have my next eye surgery April 7th, uh, so I won't just be using the bionic eye. I'll have two good eyes, so be kind of fun. Uh, and, yes, I see the complaints in the show notes. Uh, Kevin is just not Kevin without glasses. I could wear some glasses without lenses or something if that would help. I'm still getting used to my face, too, so it, you're not the only one suffering here. I'm suffering, too. George, let's move on to the news. Doing it in our unscripted fashion, I'm just going to pull up Anglican Inc. If people are new to the show, this uh, Anglican Unscripted is kind of a sister program to the website Anglican.inc, where we post Anglican stories uh, about what's going on here in the world, uh, many of them Christian-related as well. 
And I just want to go through here, and we'll start to hear more towards the bottom, and talk about what's going on in the news. And well, one of the big, yeah? Well, let's start with a good news story that hasn't yet been printed, but uh, okay. it's a fun little story. Uh, the Church of England may have uh, reached the peak of wokeness and starting back down the road to sanity. A church c a court ruled last week that a petition by Jesus College in Cambridge University to remove a memorial to Tobias Rustat, who was a courtier to King Charles II, uh, the petition to remove it because Rustat was a stockholder in the Royal Africa Company uh, was rejected. And the trial court held that uh, two things, that the historical claims that Rustat's fortune was made out of slavery were false. Absolutely. That the, yeah. that it, the, basically a bunch of undergraduates uh, didn't do their homework, made a complaint, and the college, in a fit of PC wokeness, decided to follow the student's complaint. Rustat made all of his money and gave the memorial before he got involved in Africa. And But the uh, the judge at the court said all memorials in churches are to sinners because only Christ alone is sinless. And Rustat was a repentant sinner, just like we all are who go to church. And, I'm, and it was Charles Moore in the Telegraph who said, this makes perfect sense. Perhaps this is the peak, and now it's all going to get better for the Church of England. But I'm a little, I, I'm a little concerned because guess who stuck his foot in his mouth again over all this issue? Don't say Justin. Justin Welby. <laughs> no. Justin Welby, while this was still before the court, said, well, I don't see what the problem is to remove a memorial to a, a slaver. Mm -hmm. They should remove it. Well, thank you, Justin, for being ignorant of the facts. And thank you for offering an opinion by someone of importance in the middle of a trial. Rustat was not a slaver. R Welby didn't know what he was talking about. And you would have thought after the fiasco of the George Bell affair, where he rubbished George Bell, one of the greatest English churchmen of the 20th century, falsely and was uh, libelous in his comments about him, uh, slanderous. Slanderous. Uh, yeah. He would uh, he would be cautious before dumping on another dead white man. Well, Justin, you're two for two now. You know, uh, or three for three. George, except George Carey's not dead. Not but dead yet. On, no, he's doing dumped fine. on Carey. You've <laughs> dumped on. Uh, George Bell, and they have dumped on Tobias Rustat, and each time you've had to back down after looking the fool. Well, but no. good for the Church of England's consistory court for having some common sense and Christian theology in this question of memorials. Well, you posted a story this week that talked about the 500 clergy people and the bishops and the archbishops who wrote to uh, the climate, no, they wrote to the prime minister uh, about uh, getting rid of fossil fuels and going pure solar, pure wind, uh, pure raindrops. And I'm like, you know, the latest, even from the climatologists, say that it's not going to be as bad as we said it was going to be. Now, yeah, the, their big report from uh, last April said, I know we said it would be three degrees. It's more like half a degree in the next 50 years. Well, that's well, kind Kevin, of news. I, Kevin, I think... I finally need to come out of the closet and say I'm a born Bjorn Lomberg man. Uh, I just this this the climate change is sort of psychotic neuroses uh, for the for the left in Britain mm -hmm. and in the United States too, because there's no scientific. Uh, there was a recent statement out of South Africa uh, where they the South African Church got the bishops of Mozambique to sign a document saying no to oil exploration in Mozambique. Now, the best thing that you can do for the poor in the world is make them rich. And the only uh, way to well, make the, them rich is to give them cheap energy. <laughs> not spiritually. <laughs> no, to raise the life, living standards right. and living uh, lifestyles of the poor. Mm -hmm. These people whom the church loves to talk about all the time you give them cheap energy, you build roads, you build schools, you give them the benefits of industrialization and mm -hmm. raise their standards of living. And instead, the church wants to keep people poor and naive and simple and takes money uh, 
from the Russian government uh, in the form of subsidies so that we don't have more, ex more oil exploration. Uh, instead, we have to buy it from the Russians. But this whole shale oil controversy in Britain and the United States, turns out that the Russian government was funding the Sierra Club's uh, opposition to it, yes. Op opposition to it. Mm -hmm. Now, the Russians all greeny weeny? No. Mm -hmm. They just, they've got oil, we don't. And they know that this electric windmill stuff is a waste of time and energy. And when it all falls apart, they'll have to come to them to buy the oil. Sadly, and I hate to go back to, you know, our 30 years of, of unlearnedness, but nuclear power is the solution to the lack of electricity. Um, it's been proven safe over and over again. And everywhere it operates, it operates uh, almost flawlessly. However, we've had two incidents in the last uh, 40, 50 years, and it's freaked everybody out. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. The new generation of nuclear reactors are not able to melt down because nope. they don't have... It's a different process. It's, uh, they don't have core. You're right. So that the, the fears of another uh, uh, Chernobyl or mm. Three Mile Island, you remember that in the 70s in Pennsylvania? <laughs> yes. That's not possible with the newest technologies, which, mm. of course, in the United States... Well, what's his name? Bill Gates is investing in this technology. <laughs> And though I don't follow Bill Gates on a lot of moral issues, I do think the guy has got something upstairs where he knows uh, technology a sure. little better than I do. A little bit, a little bit. You know, he knows how to. Yeah, but if he's really invested heavily here, are we going to have to reboot the nuclear reactor every couple of weeks to keep it running? I just look. <laughs> <laughs> just the blue screen of death. She appears on the monitor of the nuclear reactors. I'm a little, you know, I'm just. <laughs> I hope Microsoft is not you know, part of the, the solution there. Um, let's go back here to some news on uh, Anglican.inc. Kind of a new format here. Uh, did we talk about Trinity yet? Give no, a Laurie, support? Laurie Thompson, the dean and president, retired. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're searching for a successor. And Trinity's uh, search committee, which is led by Bishop Archbishop Bob Duncan, mm -hmm. and uh, I forget her first name, Labar, uh, the lay chairman, co-chairman, Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I wish I knew her. I'm, it'll come to me after I've done the talk. After all done. That's unscripted. <laughs> gave a report saying they've they looked at like 30 plus applicants, 28 or so uh, applicants, and they've narrowed it down to a good core of people. And I really think that's encouraging it is, because yeah. there have been times when they couldn't get anybody to take that job. And they essentially had to have basically independently wealthy people like Peter Moore uh, to take the job. But Trinity has grown under the leadership that they've had over the past 20, 30 years and is self-funding, self-sufficient. And uh, Lori Thompson did a great job and they're looking for somebody to take it to the next level. Yeah. And so, it, it, truth be told, it's one of my favorite seminaries, uh, certainly in America, if not around the world. And I think it's really fought its way through um, some economic tough times. And it's, it's fun to see uh, the students that come out of there, they uh, lead some of the, the best Anglican and Episcopal churches uh, around the world. However, I think now, I don't know if they're still Episcopal anymore. I've heard rumors that you know um, the Episcopal church doesn't want to send anybody there. I'm not sure if I can you know, speak to that, if you know anything. Well, yes, I know a little bit about that. Uh, it's not the Episcopal church, it's of individual diocese. Mm -hmm. And Central Florida sent a lot of people there. Then they had that fight uh, where Bishop Brewer, who used to teach at mm -hmm. uh, Trinity Seminary, we have a good number of its graduates among the clergy ranks here. Bishop Brewer broke with them after Bishop Brewer uh, got involved in a fight with the dean in Orlando because the dean declined to baptize the child of a gay couple. Right. And Bishop Brewer stepped in and uh, Basically, it was a PR fiasco. And he was and asked by Trinity to step down. Yes, step down, and in and a response, uh, I don't think we've formally sent people. People could still mm -hmm. go there, but I think uh, people have been directed to go to other places. Have been encouraged to look at places like Neshota House, or local seminaries like the Reformed uh, Seminary in Orlando, rather than going up to, to Trinity. But you know, new bishop next year for Central Florida, they'll probably reopen the doors because it was a personal thing, not a corporate decision. 
Okay. But each diocese decides where it wants to send its clergy. Yeah, I just I've heard a rumor that the Episcopal Church kind of put out a unofficial statement: "Don't do Trinity." And I'm like, yeah, it sounds kind of fishy, you know. Well, let's people go. like to think they have the power to say that, but they yeah. really don't. No. And frankly, at the end of the day, nobody really cares where you go to seminary. It's who you are as a priest. It is, you. but I, I don't want general seminary in my S CV right now, uh, or Swanee, you know. Well, there are wonderful survivors of general in Swanee, like Lori Thompson and Bob Absolutely. Duncan are general yeah. seminary gra uh, graduates. Yes. So. <laughs> More recently, I'm talking. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, ooh, Michael Curry put out a statement on uh, Madeline Albright's death. Any, is that uh, of interest to our viewers, George? Absolutely not. No, I don't think so. Uh, we, we just we just do our due duty and uh, report that, but I don't think we need to spend any time on it. Uh, let's see. Welby presses government on security implications of outsourcing ships' crews on UK shipping routes. Oh, come on. Really? Well, that's kind yeah, of a dumb story. P well, no, not really. Uh, P&O lines are the ferry channels, cross ferry channels. Uh -huh. And P&O was, was bought by a Dutch outfit. And P&O laid off all its British workers who were making British labor, uh, paying British level wages, uh -huh. and has brought in Indians and South Asians and paying them international seamen's wages, which are nothing, next to nothing. Quarters, yeah. So, so do, the Port of Dover has lost 800 jobs, and Welby is the bishop of that area. And so Welby is saying, hey, this, you know, in the United States, the United States has a rule that uh, if a freighter or a, a ship goes between two U.S. ports, it must be U.S. crude. So all the oil that comes down, you know, the Exxon Valdez, when it left Alaska to come down to Long Beach or wherever it was headed, had an American crew and American captain. And we do that in case of time of war, we need to mobilize the merchant marine that we have an active working merchant navy. Right. And Welby is saying we should do what the Americans do, which is make sure we have an active working merchant navy by mandating that certain, uh, that if you ship something from, from Scotland, if you ship coals from Newcastle down to London, I don't think they mind coal anymore in England, but no, if you did, uh, you have to use a British crew, British flag ship, uh, which I think it makes perfect sense, not from an economic perspective. It's much cheaper to pay Indians next to nothing, but it does make economic sense to maintain a merchant navy in case of time of war than when you need your merchant navy. Because remember, the Germans almost starved Britain to death, and it was the merchant navy that kept them alive to help them win the war. That's true. That's good. A good history. So I, I would think Justin is fair. I, I, Justin, it's a local issue for him. He talked about it in the House of Lords, and I think I, I think he was on the right side there. He, he was the right, as a person with finance in his background and middle management in his background. This was a good response to this situation. Absolutely, no question about it. Uh, going back to our uh, little web page here, uh, we got. Australian Anglican bishops call for special Afghan intake. Uh, I can move on. Church yeah. of England House of Bishops to meet. They're meeting this week. That's a good topic because there's lots of things for them to talk about. Yeah, you know, except they'll talk about it, but we won't hear about it. That's right. Uh, they they just tell us what they talked about, but they don't mm -hmm. tell us any actions or demand or resolution to issues. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, this is going to be a, a, actually a big story we need to talk about because um, it's a headline story. We have dire warnings on the health and spiritual vigor of the Catholic Church. Yeah, Sandro Magister. Uh, Sandro Magister mm -hmm. is a Vaticanista, uh, which sounds like someone who serves you coffee at Starbucks, well, but really... The, his clerics really, kind of say the same thing if you would look at his uniform. <laughs> Really, it, it is someone who was a Vatican watcher, and he is one of the best of the best. He writes for Italian newspaper L'Espresso. And he has reported that a memorandum is circulating among the, among the College of Cardinals in the Vatican, which is basically saying that Francis has been an utter, complete fiasco 
for the Catholic Church as an institution. And this, this memo goes through all of the ills that Francis has either closed a blind eye to. In other words, the German church uh, wanting to change the rules on women clergy and homosexuality and mm -hmm. uh, abortion and divorce and remarriage. Uh, the, going the Pacamama uh, fiasco where the uh, synod uh, Amazon had uh, these uh, pagan symbols that uh, were uh, displayed oh, yeah, okay. under the yeah. on you know and yeah. just how Francis is also sort of mean spirited. There's a cardinal on trial for uh, financial mismanagement. And they've changed the rules of procedure four times during the trial, Francis has, to allow this guy to be convicted and not really put up a defense. And they also say that, you know, the Vatican has been running a deficit for 10 plus years, and you can't blame Francis for that. But it's reaching a point that there's not going to be any money left because uh, they've just lost 200 million euros in the, a real estate deal in London. And Francis has just not been able to write the ship. And the damning thing, here's the damning statement, is that uh, the future of the Catholic Church is to become a more loose federation of churches like the Anglicans. Oh, my God. Oh, that, oh, that hurts. We're not <laughs> even going to be like the Orthodox <laughs> because at least the Orthodox stamp out heresy. Instead, we're going to become like the Anglicans where, it, where it's whatever floats your boat, man. Ouch. So what what the Catholics are saying is that Francis has managed to import the Anglican decline, but distill it into the last six, seven, eight years, mm -hmm. where it took us 50 years to get to this point. So it's an unsigned memo, so we don't know its veracity. Uh, can't lay it on anybody's feet, but... Uh, they're just the concert. Well, we should say the traditionalists, the conservatives, mm -hmm. are really, really fearful because they look at the liturgy of the assaults on traditionalist and cloistered nuns. Uh, the Vatican is basically beating up on these poor cloistered nuns who all they do is pray while allowing uh, the sort of frumpish women who are not dressed as nuns but who are nuns to run rapid you know be like nuns on the bus and what was it 2016 uh cam campaigning for hillary clinton yeah or beating up on the uh traditionalist latin right people mm -hmm. and letting the guys with the guitars and the turtlenecks run riot uh and so the the warnings i guess what i'm saying is that reading this I almost hate to say that, but been there, done that. Yeah. And yes, if you don't, if you don't get your act together, you're going to be like us. But in true fashion, I think Pope Francis is a Vatican II pope. You know, if, if you want to, you know, identify all the changes and reforms made out of Vatican II, and pick a pope based on that, Pope Francis is that person. You, you argue with me in the comments if I'm wrong, but you know th that's how I see it. Let's talk more about what we see on the Anglican.ig webpage here. Global meeting of Anglican primates takes place in London, comma, and nobody cares. Nobody cares, and we don't even know who's there. Yeah. The official word is that this meeting is more of a get-together because they've not had an in-person meeting for some time. They were going to meet in Rome earlier this year, but there were still COVID restrictions and visa restrictions in place. They were going to meet at the Anglican Center in Rome, but it was postponed, and now they're meeting uh, in London. But the press statement doesn't tell us who was there, which is a giveaway that there are people not coming. And they say that there's no formal agenda. It's just time of fellowship and conversation and getting to know one another. Um, now, as a somewhat critic of the Anglican communion, I actually encourage non-agenda meetings if they if this is truly a non-agenda meeting and if you're truly to get together for fellowship and encouragement we're called in scripture to to gather together to encourage one another daily so if this doesn't have an agenda which I kind of doubt it doesn't but if it doesn't good job 
Lambeth, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and I hope you stick to your word that we're not going to sit here and have a, a four-page communique come out about all the changes you're making uh, in the, the sex and transgendered world. I hope this is just a, we got together, we prayed, and we became friends. That's cool. I encourage that. For those who are wondering, Foley Beach is was in Ireland this past mm -hmm. weekend, but he's not been invited to this meeting, as I understand it. I've uh, not uh, talked to him uh, yeah. <laughs> about it, but... Uh, he's over there. He, he's over there. Uh, oh, hold on. Another good story coming up here. Let me pull this up here. This is the fun ones. Working group calls Episcopalians to address harms of white supremacy, legacies of col uh, colonialism, and etc. Oh boy, how exciting. But I need to go through and just rehash the short history of the Episcopal Church. If memory serves, it is not a direct descendant or consecrate of the Church of England, right? Sort of. Its bishop, Did, its episcopacy C was given to it by the Scots, not the yes. English. Bishop Seabury, if I remember correctly. Yeah. But it came at, but it was the Church of England in, the, in America. Then we had a revolution, and it was no longer the Church of England in America. That's right. We were the Episcopal Church, and it wasn't until the 1850s that Episcopal clergy were allowed, were recognized as clergy by the Church of England. In other so words, could, up until the 1850s, you were basically in the position that an ACNA clergyman is today right. to the Church of England. You're sort of a priest, but we're not going to do anything about it for you. So if they had to have a clandestine, illegal, secret consecration of bishops over here from Bishop Seabury, are they really colonialist? This, the Episcopal Church forming a task force to study white supremacy within the Episcopal Church. I just wonder, where are all these secret clansmen that uh, that they're going to be looking for? Yeah. Uh, it, it, Even in the past. Well, I can't think of, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know, they were a big part of the Democratic Party 50 years ago, but I can't think of any uh, supremacists within. Well, hold on. I can think of a lot of anti-Latino uh, Episcopal leadership, but that's different. well. Well, it this may be an an occasion to beat up on Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis that's and true. other leaders of the Confederacy who happen to be Episcopalian, or uh, really what I what I see going on is um, in the nineties and the beginning of this century there was a big push for the 2020 movement to double the church by the year 2020. Mm -hmm. And some really good work was done in this area. And one of the recommendations was to really unleash Hispanic ministries. And the thinking was that liturgically, uh, immigrants from South America were familiar with Catholic rites and rituals that, and would were at home in an Anglican style of worship. And we should look to raise up uh, clergy from this group and establish Hispanic congregations. And the National Church said, no, we're not going to do that uh, because diversity for us means blacks. We're going to, and if we raise up Hispanics, that will dilute the power of the African American caucus. The black voice, yeah. In the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. And so. The Episcopal Church still has a very, very, uh, I would say, poor uh, record for uh, att attracting non-white people to it. And part of it is has been that the church is uh, more focused on preserving the racial balances of 100 years ago than the current ones of the Episcopal Church. Now that you will hear lip service and you will see Hispanic ministries and all this and that, but I'm talking about money and institutions. There are no there are no Hispanic uh, Episcopal colleges being established. There are well, no Hispanic. Uh, and to be honest, their Hispanic outreach is for reprogramming. They want to be sure that the the pro life Hispanics of the of you know uh, South America understand that. Pro pro abortion is just as fine too. Thank you very much. 
and that you know sex and gender rules aren't quite the way you believe under the the uh, your post Roman Catholic uh, doctrines. You know, here is Anglicans and Episcopalians. We we think differently, and so there's a lot of reprogramming going on in the Hispanic ministries. So, by by the by the by the people in charge. Mm -hmm. yes, now right. the facts in the ground the facts in the ground are always going to be different. I have a number of Hispanics, uh, people first generation Americans from Peru and Mexico and all these mm -hmm. different places, who were reared as Catholics back in Peru, who are now Anglicans, and it was very easy for them to slide into our way of worship. And what's been difficult for them, uh, I don't want to say difficult, but what has been an education for them is understanding Anglican doctrine and discipline and theology. In other words, getting away from the father knows best. In other words, the priest says X, you do it. Um, I wish I could tell them to do that, but that's not <laughs> what we teach. Or the uh, the place of, uh, of women in the life of the church. And I'm not talking about women priests or anything like that, but women being uh, the church is for women only. Uh, men just don't go. If they do, they go for uh, uh, weddings, Easter, baptisms, Christmas, and their funeral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so, in other words, changing the cultural approaches to worship as opposed to liturgical forms has been the challenge in attracting Hispanics. And it's, it's doable, mm -hmm. especially as their children are reared in the American uh, culture. But the Episcopal Church still has this undying uh, desire to fight the battles of the last generation, whatever that battle was. Okay, on to some more news. <laughs> this is going to be a fun story because it's more relevant today with what's going on between Russia and the uh, Ukraine or Ukraine. And so we need to talk about what Pope Francis, talking about Pope Francis again, has decided to do in order to, uh, I think he thinks this will make peace with the, the Orthodox. Well, they're very, there are a number of different ways to approach this story. Mm -hmm. And some people will be offended by what we have to say because there are some who, can, who will look at this through a purely spiritual lens, whereas I'm approaching this from a pragmatic approach about basically not that this is an action of the spirit in the world, but rather the men and women in charge of churches, how are they dealing with these variables? 1917, it was a, a shepherd girl and her brother and younger sister, I believe, saw an image of the Virgin Mary in Fatima in Portugal. And this is whole, this uh, developed around this very prominent uh, Our Lady of Fatima belief, and she had some revelations which we shared with the children, mm -hmm. which were written down. And one of these, and there's some that still have not been revealed to the to the world. They're still kept secret. They're kept secret at the Vatican, correct? Uh, but one of these was that uh, Russia needs to be consecrated to Our Lady, and Russia needs to be converted. Now, this was known early on, and this was at the time of the start of the Russian Revolution, and then we had mm -hmm. communism and all this and that. The Vatican never went forward to consecrate Russia. In, to the to the uh, Immaculate Heart of Mary. Uh, and part of this was because it would imply that the Orthodox needed to be converted to Catholicism. And the Catholic Church was not ready to pick a fight with the Orthodox yet. Fast forward to today. At the start of the war in Ukraine, the Vatican took a very much of a hands-off approach. They bemoaned war, but they did not beat up on Putin as a person or the Russian Orthodox Church for supporting the war. They did not engage the Russian Orthodox Church's theological claims about the mission of the Russian people to be the third Jerusalem, the standard bearer for God in this world and the fight against the corrupt and decadent forces of Western secularism. Vatican didn't get involved in that. They just said, please stop, please stop. What can you do to get things to stop? Well, people went to Francis and said, now's the time to convert Russia. And Francis, 
who really wasn't who really doesn't get involved in the day-to-day -day minutia of uh, interchurch relations said okay let's do it within 30 days we had this prayer of consecrating russia now in the past and what this basically does is it says that uh, to the russian church how the russians hear this is that we catholics are now making claims on the souls of the people of russia leave orthodoxy become catholic you are no better and than pagan you you're no better than episcopalians <laughs> and so yeah so, so the so there's a now personally my theological worldview doesn't really doesn't really see a role for the virgin for role for the virgin mary to be consecrated her heart of russia i mean uh the mother of Christ is a holy, wonderful woman. I'm not saying anything so, negative, but I she, don't elevate she her. at one time served a wonderful role in our current kingdom. I'm not one of these people that push the co-redemptrix line or pray to the Virgin Mary or things of that nature because mm -hmm. I just don't think it's necessary because we have unfettered access to the Son and through the Son we get to the Father. We don't go fact, to the Mother, then to the Son, and then to the Father. Anytime you add or subtract something from Jesus, you've created a cult. Yeah. And now that's, people that's, will take issue with this and, and for I some people their spirituality is focused on the person of the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. that's, okay. that's great. But for me, does doesn't do anything it to me it's just about it's an incantation uh we're saying magical words uh, to basically poke a finger in the eye of our enemy mm -hmm. now it's interesting that the russians have not yet exploded their general synod has been meeting this week and kirill has reaffirmed uh, the russian theological worldview which is that it is up to russia to be the vet to be that line of defense against an evil and corrupt West, the gay agenda, the transgender agenda, the whole woke business is a work of the devil. And we and, Russians have suffered under communism. And if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck. And well, this totalitarianism here, here, coming out of the West sure. is Stalinism point two. But here's where Kirill has made it a spiritual war. It's no longer a war of missiles, a war of tanks. It's now a spiritual war because we're fighting wokeness. Now, I believe that Curl is full of BS. And if you're Curl, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. Don't send anybody to take care of me. But um, yeah, he's a big hairy guy, Kevin. He can take care like, of himself. You know, this. I don't believe that the, the, the Russian Church actually believes this. Um, I think they're just covering, you know, their tushes because uh, they want to support Russia and they want to support Putin. And it has been very beneficial uh, post-communism to be on Putin's side. And uh, Putin, Putin's enemies are not long for this world. And, it, you know. The, the surveys and polls done in Russia during the war show that at least three quarters of the people back the war. Mm -hmm. Um this is not unpopular in Russia. There will be some Russian expatriates. There'll be Russian oligarchs who see their yachts and townhouses being seized by governments who will distance themselves from Putin, some mm -hmm. liberal Russians, but there are always going to be people who distance themselves from the government in power. But the average Russian, by even if he may not darken the halls of a church ever, buys into the belief of the destiny of the Russian people. And for, a, for the Western audience, we're never going to learn this. And the reason why is because uh, Twitter and Facebook and the networks have all banned the Russian outlets of news. Mm -hmm. You can't hear what the Russians are saying to themselves. Well, and, you know, you, you, if they forwarded it to the Taliban, the Taliban could tweet it for oh, That's Russians. right. I'm, they I'm they haven't thought of that yet, but <laughs> just saying. There's ways so around the, the Twitter thing. So... It, Again, I'm not pro-Russian. Um, I'm uh, I'm pro-American. Uh, Yankee uh, Doodle. I, uh, I, I I'm not pro-Russian or pro-Putin. I hope that Putin loses this. I hope that uh, um, his dreams of being the next Napoleon are, are thwarted. Um, I, well, yeah, it's I, interesting. I, yeah. Go on. 
But one of the things I find is uh, I occasionally will turn on CNN and listen to these lieutenant colonels give their views of what's happening, and hmm. I feel like saying, God, I'm not an army guy, but boy, I know more than this fella does. Um, and these people who say Putin is failing and this and that, you can only you need to have a measure. What was Putin's plan at the beginning? And against that, you mark it. You can't really say that he's failing because he didn't achieve up to your expectations. What were his expectations? We don't know. Well, he didn't now, the latest the latest news, if you strip off all the the crapola and everything, is the Rus the Russians have halted their press on Kiev, but are consolidating and encircling the forces in the east of the country. So basically. It looks like while keeping the people occupied in Kiev, the Russians are rolling up those portions of Kiev of Ukraine that they want to keep long term, that they're not giving back. So they couldn't keep Kiev. Why would they want to occupy a, a foreign city that would be an unrest for all these years? But if they use their army to and keep the bulk of the, the Ukrainian army busy defending the capital, that allows them to achieve the victories they want. That's why they're doing all this devastation, I believe, to Mariupol on the coast, because they're going to keep Mariupol, and they need to crack and destroy all opposition, and they're not using the same degree of weaponry and attacks against Kiev and Lvov and places on the west of the country. There you go. For what it's worth, what well, do I know? I, I, well, for what it's worth, I think uh, Putin is surprised by uh, the resolve of NATO, and he was uh, certainly surprised that uh, Europe would uh, join in sanctions. Uh, I don't think he saw that coming. And I think long term, he's not going to, even though he wants to keep the, uh, the eastern side there of Ukraine, I think sanctions long term are going to hurt him. But I think he stays in office because he's Putin. So, well, you know, you know that's what we thought in 1961. We'll put mm -hmm. sanctions on Fidel Castro. That'll teach him. That'll teach uh, they're, they're still there. <laughs> I know they've been are. there since before you and I were born, and yeah. they're still there. The hard-headedness of the average communist or <clears throat> university professor is just, you know, unacknowledgeable. So let's talk more about what's going on here. Um, there's GAFCON news. There's going to be a GAFCON four, and uh, also news that Archbishop Ben Kwashi addressed GAFCON in great britain i thought we could talk about that yeah, he was in the, belfast uh, as was foley beach Asia. and others yeah. they had a this past weekend they were at, i think at saint anne's cathedral in belfast mm -hmm. and ben kwashi gave the address to the gafcon great britain and europe gathering um not really a lot of news to report other than that they met yeah. um now may, maybe more stuff will come out of it but it's more of a rah-rah session than a strategic or planning meeting which but it's, it's good it's fine i mean we've seen them have the planning sessions we've seen them try to build coalitions we've seen a lot of you know working over the last 10 years and with failures if they can take more of a slower approach and have more success i'm, I'm all for that you know maybe some rah rah sessions will do i don't know don't know so that's happening uh gafcon 4 where's it going to be when's it going to be uh, 2023 in the early summer in Kigali, Rwanda. Okay. And I would go to the gafcon.org website for more information. If you want to get tickets, I think they're expecting 3,000 people. That's about right. That's what they garner. Um, let's go back here and look at the news on Anglican Inc. Oh, let's also talk a little bit about the uh, Archbishop of the West uh, Indies, George. West Africa. Africa. Jonathan Sorry, West Africa. Jonathan Hart. Mm -hmm. now, this has got a GAFCON angle to it. When GAFCON was founded, the Archbishop of West Africa, Justice Akrofe, he was Bishop of Accra in Ghana, mm -hmm. was one of the founding primates. And he came to all the meetings. West Africa is very heavily involved in the GAFCON movement. Then he stepped down. And his successor uh, held the same theological views, but he decided to keep his lines of communication to London and New York open so that he could have the first class travel to Trinity Wall Street and to Toronto and all these things. And West Africa fell out of GAFCON, uh, not because it was opposed to it, but because they wanted to play both sides. Well, uh, Jonathan Hart is, is the Bishop of Liberia. 
And since 2019, he's been the Archbishop of West Africa. He had a stroke and is currently in a hospital in the United States recuperating, and he has decided to retire because he's unable to uphold the functions office of bishop because of his stroke and the paralysis and the damage done to his body. Liberia has already elected a uh, coadjutor, so that man will step forward. So now West Africa, which is about a million Anglicans, spread across uh, Ghana and seven other countries, Cameroon, Cape Verde, Guinea, uh, Senegal, uh, so on and so forth, the Gambia. They uh, will be electing two archbishops. They'll elect the archbishop. Uh, West Africa is two provinces co internally comprising one whole province. The whole province is called West Africa. One internal province is the Church of Ghana, and that's the 11 or 12 dioceses of Ghana. And then the other province is West Africa, and that's everybody else, eight or nine bishops. Ghana wants to be its own church and has basically been crossing the I's and dotting the T's to follow people like Chile, who last year became its own province, or Alexandria became its own province. Ghana is going that way too. So Ghana needs to elect an internal Archbishop of West Africa and then an archbishop of the entire province. Now, here's the opportunity for Ben Kwashi to go on his bike and ride up to uh, Ghana, mm -hmm. uh, because it'll probably be Cyril Ben Smith, the archbishop of Ghana, will probably become the archbishop of West Africa, and just because they they do a sort of Buggins turn. Yeah. You know, it's next. It's like the Republican Party. Next it's the line, next yeah. guy next in line. Bob Dole said, "It's my turn." Now, Ghana's been in the news lately. Cyril Ben Smith uh, is the Archbishop of uh, Ghana. And the Ghanaian Church has backed the Ghana's anti-gay laws. And then Cyril, then it was reported in the Church Times after Welby complained that Cyril, be that the Ghanaian Church was asking the government to be, take a softer line. And that was all reported in the Western press because of story out of the Church Times. Well, the problem is the Church of Ghana hasn't told the Ghanaian people this yet. So what's going on? Either the Church Times made something up, which I doubt, Very or nice. Cyril, or the Ghanaian Church is saying one thing for Western ears and another thing for African ears. This is an opportunity for Ben Kwashi to go in and get the Ghanaians to nail their colors to the mast. Mm -hmm to get them to stop. Maybe it's because they want to be their own province that they want to play ball with uh, the ACC and with Welby. Maybe their a price is being extracted, but the Ghanaians don't, the Ghanaians are in line with the Nigerians theologically. A little hot, more high church, but they're still in line with the Ghanaians, uh, the, the Nigerians. Yeah, I and I think something is, been, there's a quid pro quo being demanded. So you get a so you get well be able to release something to people in London who are all upset, but hiding it from the people in Ghana itself. To me, it smells like uh, this is the price you guys have to pay. Well, this is the time that you sign up somebody, as they're being basically forced to eat crow and forced to uh, do things they don't want to do. This is when you sign them up to be on your side once they can break for cover. Break for absolutely. Cover. This is a great opportunity. All right, well, let's finish up with the biggest little story of the week. George. I think this, this is... Gonna, yeah. This is an interesting story. The Privy Council is... The judicial uh, portion of the Privy Council is the highest court for Commonwealth countries who they can take advantage of the Privy Council as a Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And it's in London. And it's a vestige of the British Empire. Well, two British possessions, overseas territories, the Cayman Islands and Bermuda, have been going through the gay marriage fights. Bermuda had a local judge that forced gay marriage on the country. The legislature said, no, we're not going to do it. And unended gay marriage. The Cayman Islands has had people demand gay marriage, and the government's refused to do it. All of this revolted, resulted in lawsuits. And the lawsuits went through the various Supreme and Superior Courts locally 
until they arrived at the doorstep in London and were consolidated into one case. And the Privy Council ruled that, the, that there is no right to gay marriage, and by a four to one vote, said Bermuda and the Cayman Islands may reject gay marriage. Whoa. Now, this, is, this is a big, this is, uh, this is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, essentially, they didn't have, uh, oh, what was that squishy U.S. Supreme Court judge who uh, basically pushed the United States into mandating gay marriage? Um, they basically looked at the same arguments legally, philosophically, and came to a different conclusion. Wait, wasn't that Alito? No, not Alito. He was a, he was a conservative all along. It was the fellow who, ret- well, whatever, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Okay. It doesn't matter. Um, the interesting thing is here is that should Britain at the end of time decide to undo its gay marriage and all this and that laws, it is able to do so mm-hmm. because Parliament is supreme in these matters. And it's set precedent. Yes. Yeah. And the U.S. argument, which is the argument we've had over abortion, that there is this sort of right of personal right of liberty out there mm-hmm. for gay marriage, for abortion, for these things, which isn't in the Constitution, but we think it should be. That because, line of thinking yeah. did not go down well in the Privy Council. Mm-hmm. So in the United States, we basically have to have the state Supreme Court rethink itself or the states publish uh, states adopt a constitutional amendment to undo that um, which is neither is going to happen in the next few years uh, no. maybe an abortion who knows but certainly not on gay marriage no but I mean that's that's the strangest thing about this you know the gay activists here in America are so righteous and self-righteous about their causes but you know disney's a perfect example we're not going to go to disney or ride disney rides until disney is more proactive in taking down the governor of florida and i'm like you're not like this with disney china you're not like this with disney russia you know why don't you go there in march and 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 make a bigger stink um it's it's just hard to watch so all right, George, we have covered, I think, all the relevant stories in a kind of a new format. If this didn't work, just let us know in the comments. We'll go back to just writing down our notes and, and doing it that way. But it's time to, ch- after 725 episodes, change things up. You may look at the background, but Kevin, you're not, you're not in your, your coach. Well, I am. Mrs. Anglican TV said I had to do my show in the, in the bedroom because she had a conference call. So here, here I am. George, I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 725 of Anglican Unscripted.